Greetings. Today is uh, it's November 6th, 2022. My name is Mohammed Jahan Parvar, and I'm an advisor at Cyrus Forum. Cyrus Forum is a venue for experts in different fields uh, to forge a vision for the post-Islamic Republic Iran based on shared values of uh, liberal democracy. And uh, the goal is to empower Iranians to using the experiences available to various uh, uh, to various experts in different fields uh, to build a future for Iran based on individual liberties, freedom, freedom of choice, and liberal demo uh, liberal democratic values. Today we are going to talk about a vision for the post-Islamic Republic economy. And here we are going to have Dr. Saeed Qasem Najad, a senior member of the Foundation for uh, Defending of Democracies, uh, who has uh, extensive experience in uh, issues related to Iran, per Persian Gulf region, international diplomacy, sanctions, and illicit finance. Joining us is also Dr. Burgan uh, Narajabad, uh, an economist with extensive experience in banking, financial institutions, financial stability, and macroeconomics. Uh, at some point, we may have uh, Dr. Sara Bazubandi joining us, although that's uh, unfortunately due to uh, unforeseen reasons. We haven't been able to make contact with her. She resides in Europe. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to give the forum to uh, Fer Said and then Borgon to briefly talk about the period that we envision may affect Iran right after the uh, after the uh, collapse of Islamic Republic. Uh, specifically, we are we are we will be talking about three periods after uh, Islamic Republic. The very short term, typically about one year up to the point that the uh, th that a transitional government comes to uh, comes to power. Uh, the uh, assembly, the constitutional assembly taking shape and holding the first, uh, the, the first uh, elections. And uh, then after that, we are going to talk about the potential constitution and what would happen after the democratic government is actually in place uh, in Iran. With that, uh, Said, uh, the floor is yours. Let's actually talk about first or the immediate period following the collapse of the Islamic Republic. Thank, thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to thank the Cyrus Forum for organizing this. This is a very important topic in question. Uh, on the immediate uh, issue, I want to just lay the ground for what I want to discuss. I think in, before saying anything about that uh, issue, I want to say something which may sound like a cliche, but it's absolutely true. And that's the fact that a big part of Iran's uh, economic problem is political, which, and it's caused by political decisions that the regime has made. And if those political decisions are changed, I think you will see, uh, in some cases, an immediate effect. In some cases, not immediate, but uh, quite short, short-term effect, uh, in a positive way on Iran's economy. Let me just give you a few examples. For example, the nuclear issue. Like for the past 15 years, the nuclear issue has dominated uh, anything related to Iran. Uh, there are different estimates of how much it has cost Iran, but estimates are in hundreds of billions of dollars. So you had you had like two uh, periods of extensive sanctions. We are still in one of them in the la in the latest one. And uh, so if you have a transitional government, which is a normal government has very, you know, has a, it's, it does not want to engage in uh, exporting revolution or exporting terrorism, the nuclear issue can be resolved uh, rather quickly, I think. Uh, the second one is like the issue of terrorism. You know, like the, san the sanctions which have been uh, imposed on Iran that are multi-layered, a big, uh, an important layer of that is the tourism issue. Uh, the tourism issue also like affects uh, Iran's economy through other channels. For example, the direct uh, financial support 
that the regime provides to these terrorist groups. Depending on which year we are talking, it's it, it, the range of this financial support is between hundreds of millions of dollars to a few billion dollars. So these are the money that's not being spent on uh, infrastructure or welfare. The other issue related to the terrorism, as I said, are sanctions. Then you have, then they have caused troubles for Iran in the relation with uh, its neighbors and other countries around the world. That has uh, economic effect. That has like it increases your financial risk. It, it uh, uh, prevents like FDI and all all things related. So if you stop funding terrorism, you have to see some per, uh, some percentage points. I don't know how much uh, growth in your GDP. You have the issue of missile, which is totally political. It's related to your nuclear issue. But again, you have like sanctions, significant sanctions imposed on Iran over this issue. Some of them are sectoral. So if you that issue is solved, you will see some relief there. You have the regional policy related to Israel, related to the kingdoms in the, on the so the southern bank of the Persian Gulf, which has really affected the, Iran's economy, its relation with the neighbors, the FBI, the trade. You have the biggest elephant in the room, the relation with, with the United States. The, the U.S. is a world superpower. It's, a, it's the heart of the financial uh, network, global financial network. It's the biggest economy still. So if you can resolve that issue, Again, you will have, you will see an effect, immediate effect in your economy. Uh, you, the FATF issue, the FATF issue has stopped over the uh, uh, financing, over financing terrorism. So you don't have access to financial network, partly due to the FATF issue. And let's go to domestic, like you have a regime which is extremely corrupt and incompetent. These are not issues that you can uh, resolve quickly. But imagine if you have just free press and free and fair election, which, is, which are some things that I think, based on what we see in the opposition, almost all opposition groups agree. I think just having those two fundamentals will you know, uh, decrease the effect of corruption and incompetence. And you will see that effect in your economy. You have millions of Iranians outside the country, some, uh, some say over 5 million. So these are like a large portion of them are educated. A good number of them are from professional class, business owners who are of the upper middle class in the foreign countries that they reside. They have uh, collectively, they have access to significant financial resources, important net network, valuable expertise. So they can, and then you have a smaller circle of top business executives, top uh, government officials, uh, top entrepreneur. They have massive financial resources, massive uh, network of influence. That can be used to help Iran's economy now because of the regime. Because if you go to Iran, they, <clears throat> they, they see you as a hostage. So uh, I just want to make the case here that if you have if you remove this regime and you have a normal government, I'm not saying a very competent one, I'm not saying a very uh, you know, special case, just a normal government that doesn't engage in these things, you will, you will see a significant uh, increase in your GDP growth, everything else equal, and that everything else equal is an important issue, uh, mainly I'm thinking about uh, security, but everything else equal, you will have a, it will have a significant economic uh, effect. Now let me go to the immediate uh, issues related uh, to economy when the regime fall, when the regime falls. There are, <clears throat> I think, thousands of states of the world after the fall of the regime. Uh, depending on in which state you are, uh, things may change, but. I want to present a case that I can. I think it's realistic. Uh, it's a bit optimistic, but still realistic can happen. And let me tell you about my uh, assumption. So assumption one 
is that the, before the fall of the regime, a revolution council or a transition council will be created. I think we see the demand for it now. Based on what I see in the opposition, I think this is doable. So let's say something like this uh, is created. It's diverse. It has legitimacy among Iranians inside the country, uh, Iranian outside the country, in the international community. The legitimacy comes from uh, <clears throat> its own members who should be, you know, like uh, uh, who should represent different parts of the society and its uh, its actions in, you know, guiding the process of overthrowing the regime. So if you have this, then from that you can have a transitional government that has uh, some degree of legitimacy. This is assumption one. Let's say we have that. The two is that the transitional government follows a centrist foreign policy, which seeks to reduce uh, tension with neighbors and major power, and we are not engaged in a foreign war. I think this is assumption two. I think that's a, you know, that's not a far-fetched assumption. Uh, assumption three is that after a few weeks of the fall of the regime, we are not engaged in a larger scale civil war with the remnants of the regime security and military forces. That's a bit, uh, that's the optimistic part that I said, but it's manageable, I think. Assumption four is that after the first few weeks and months after the fall, the transitional council, even if it may not have full control over certain periods, or certain part of the country, but we are not engaged in a you know larger scale civil war with uh, separatist groups, for example. We may have like things here and there. So that that's uh, the fourth assumption. Uh, the fifth the fifth assumption is that the transitional government is quite diverse. I think that's reasonable. Like uh, the Crown Prince Fazal Pahlavi, who talked about the transitional government, made this one of the requirement. And I think everyone agrees with that. So that makes the transitional government a bit slow, a bit indecisive. It cannot make, you know, a radical decision, and which, which, is, which is good. And based on that, I think the transitional government has a narrow mandate to first provide a minimum level of political, economic, security, stability, and two, to hold a free and fair election for people to choose their representative for the Constituent Assembly, and then hold an election to say whether people agree with the Constitution that they have written or no. And after that, hold elections uh, to create the institutions that the Constitution wants, like the, the Parliament, if it's a republic, the uh, presidential election, if it's not, if it's a you know, parliamentary monarchy, uh, the two, the Senate and the Parliament. So <clears throat> with that, I think the main thing that the transitional government in the immediate uh, period after the fall of the regime, let's say two to four months, has to do is first do no, do no harm. Don't engage in fundamental uh, reform. You don't have the mandate for that. You don't have the legitimacy for that, but do not, do not harm. The, the top issue here is the survival. So how, how do you pay for imports? How do you pay for salaries? How do you prevent the economy from total collapse? I, I think if with those assumptions, we can have suspension of some sanctions easily. I'm saying it based on, you know, I have been working with these issues and with these people for like 10 years now. I think I think like people like me can go to Treasury, can go to the National Security Council, can go to the White House and say we need suspension of some sanctions. And it's totally doable. Uh, we have to be able to resume some of the oil and petrochemical exports. With the suspension of those sanctions, I think it's uh, again doable. Most of our exports right now is to China. Uh, China is going to be a problem, so we need to, to be able to diversify. The other issue is the access to currency reserve. Iran even right now has above $100 billion of currency reserve. 
uh, how much of it is fully accessible, we don't know. Uh, we know a big part of it is in China, but still you have, uh, I think they still have a decent uh, amount of uh, currency that they have access to. And the other issue, the, la the last one for this part, I have spoke a lot, it's I think the capital control during that period of time, you want to destabilize uh, your, your forex market. I think the best way for that is to engage in a rather strict uh, capital control. I think if we have those assumptions and we engage in these things, uh, the two to four months, the first two to four months, uh, the new regime can survive, and then it can you know, go into the next phase of stabilizing the economy. I also want to add something before we go to Borgon. Uh, there are a number of policies available as for a policymaker during such a period. Uh, one is to continue the current policy of the Islamic Republic to target the exchange rate uh, to stabilize the economy that may be far-fetched and impractical during that period. So imposing capital controls instead of targeting the exchange rates, that may be the more reasonable, the more feasible policy for that period. So with that explanation, you know, I actually uh, go to Borgan. Uh, Borgan, uh, I want to, uh, if possible, please take uh, please uh, take the discussion from where Said left off. And uh, what do you think for that period of, let's say two to six months after the collapse of the current government? Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, wonderful forum. Um, before anything, I should uh, just explain that uh, all the views I'm explaining here are my own views and uh, uh, not related to any uh, uh, affiliated institution uh, of mine. Uh, so um, I'm going to deviate from your suggestion, uh, Mohammed. Um, unfortunately and actually uh, instead of uh, taking ahead uh, take it one step back and and think about the importance of um, uh, the process of uh, overthrowing uh, the current uh, islamic uh, regime in iran for what will come after it um, and uh, and there, there there's a reason for that because um said uh, uh, what described uh, is uh, a possible feasible uh, scenario, but it's definitely not uh, the only scenario, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure um, Said would agree with that. Um, I totally uh, agree with uh, Said's point of view that uh, the main problem with uh, Iranian economy is uh, the political structure, and that has caused us to get into this uh, dead end, which. Uh, uh, everybody, including people within the regime, uh, agree that uh, there's no way forward. Um, very briefly, if one wants to describe uh, the current regime in Iran, it's a combination of uh, uh, kleptocracy and some uh, ideological elements which are ruling the country uh, uh, on top of a, a sort of um, confirming uh, yet um, dissatisfied uh, bureaucracy. Uh, and that, that bureaucracy, uh, I think, uh, would play uh, a very important role in this um, uh, process of getting rid of the Islamic Republic. And depending on how that role would be uh, played, I think we would have a very different uh, possible path uh, for uh, the immediate uh, uh, aftermath of the collapse of uh, the Islamic Republic, in particular whether we'll have an explosion of uh, the current regime or an sort of a more uh, managed implosion of it. Uh, so uh, I, I'll try to be a little bit more specific. Uh, if you go back to um, what happened back in 1978 and 79 in Iran, uh, we did not have uh, sort of a, a, a very active participation of uh, the bureaucracy uh, in the late um, 78. Uh, but um, uh, what happened was there was a replacement uh, sort of uh, structure in place which managed uh, in particular uh, the strike in the oil industry back in 78 and uh, showed some level of competence which uh, led to uh, 
uh, a way of a smooth transition of uh, confirming part of the bureaucracy uh, before uh, 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 to this uh, bureaucracy in the uh, in the uh, Islamic Republic. Um, and you know, of course, there were uh, rounds and rounds of uh, changes afterward. But uh, but but that transition matters. Uh, so um, as of now, so far, what we have seen, we have seen uh, some uh, levels of uh, tendencies for uh, strike, uh, but these are not uh, general strikes yet. Uh, so far, we have not seen any uh, sort of significant. Um, movement within uh, the current bureaucracy to uh, to communicate you know their uh, dissatisfaction beyond just uh, regular you know uh, nagging um, and and that matters that matters we we have started to see uh, certain you know fractions of uh, whatever is left out of the civil society in Iran particularly like you know we, we see uh, changes uh, in attitude and uh, expression of those attitude by uh, uh, medical uh, establishment in Iran uh, and sort of uh, expressing that they would be able to um, manage that transition, but we haven't seen anything of that sort amongst um, uh, economic uh, uh, part of that uh, bureaucracy. Um, and that uh, basically, if it continues to be uh, like this, that makes it uh, much more essential for uh, people um, uh, who are sitting outside the current bureaucracy uh, within Iran and outside uh, Iran to uh, put together, for example, uh, a method of uh, funding strike funds and uh, as well as um, sort of um, uh, how they can both, you know, internally and externally and how they can deliver uh, all those funds to people um, uh, in um, essential industries. Uh, and, and this would uh, be important in terms of uh, both uh, putting extra uh, pressure on the Islamic Republic as well as uh, showing competence, uh, signaling competence both to um, uh, foreign countries, foreign governments, as well as uh, the part of uh, uh, confirming uh, bureaucracy within Iran that they can uh, get away from uh, the ruling kleptocracy uh, slash you know, ideological uh, elements. Uh, so uh, that I think would be um, super important, and I and I think it, it's something in my mind which is uh, at least on paper it's uh, feasible. I'm not saying you know it, it is easy by any means, but it's feasible. Um, roughly speaking, if if you need to sort of um, uh, go after essential um, uh, industries in Iran uh, and fund their um, livelihood uh, and you know and, and their um, families. Uh, you're talking at most by any mean uh, about funding uh, 10 million people's uh, life for uh, let's say six months and that roughly speaking would uh, add up to something in the order of um, uh, given the current uh, average GDP in, you know uh, in Iran that would uh, account to something in the order of uh, 15 billion dollars and and this is something doable uh, if you tap into internal and uh, external uh, resources um, and um, to give you an idea um, uh, about what I mean by internal and external resources, uh, in uh, in the aftermath of uh, JCPO, that a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, Iranian uh, diaspora were um, somehow obviously now, you know, but at the time it was, in my opinion, it was obvious they they were. Um, they were sort of um, over optimistic about the path uh, of the Islamic Republic. Uh, they put together, you know, s some uh, significant amounts of money uh, to take to Iran. Uh, so, th you know, there were people uh, who were uh, putting together all of that money and they were betting on uh, the growth of the Islamic Republic uh, and um, and basically a high uh, payoff out of their investment. I think if, if there are people outside Iran who are serious, uh, they should be able to put together the same uh, amount of money, uh, which, as I said, it is not uh, feasible, infeasible. It, it is a, a quite feasible um, uh, amount. And the fact that we don't see that so far, it means that these people are still uh, sitting on the sideline and waiting to see what happens. And that means basically, uh, most likely in the aftermath of, uh, uh, in my mind, you know, um, 
uh, collapse of this regime, I don't know how long it will last, but you know, this, there, there's a dead end, uh, so there should be a change of course at least, or you know, complete collapse. Uh, the fact that these people are sitting aside means that they won't uh, have much take in terms of how they will uh, play a role uh, in the aftermath of uh, uh, the Islamic Republic. Uh, the fact that you know, within the country, the uh, the bureaucracy is uh, sitting silent, not you know um, waiting for a strike by let's say uh, by uh, workers and teachers rather than you know people in let's say in the banking sector, people in uh, in the Tehran exchange, people in various uh, ministries uh, coming out and saying we won't be uh, collaborating with this regime. The fact that they are sitting out it means that they are, they are losing their uh, chance. They're losing the chance of playing um, uh, a, a constructive role in the after, you know, aftermath of the Islamic Republic. Um, but you know, things might change, and there are also signals that th they could change very fast. Uh, and if that happens, then we are going to have a very smooth, you know, uh, by the stand of uh, regime changes, transition in Iran, and and then. Uh, after that, I think uh, we, we can go on the path that uh, Said is uh, describing. But, um, but it's, not, uh, it's not a given path. We might have very different paths. Uh, uh, we might have a, a, a path in which um, you might need to actually make some deals with uh, even part of that uh, kleptocracy in Iran to say that, look, you know, uh, we will uh, preserve some of your uh, uh, economic interests in the aftermath of the uh, uh, collapse of Islamic Republic uh, in exchange uh, for uh, coming along, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, security uh, concerns. Uh, so um, these are all issues that I think um, if people are um, sitting outside and thinking, you know, uh, about uh, these transitions, uh, they need to be uh, cognizant of. And, um, and I'm not, you know, just, just uh, to be clear, I'm not uh, claiming that uh, what Said described is not feasible, and, and I'm not claiming that Said is not aware of uh, all, all these possibilities. I'm just saying that th th there are a, a very a wide range of um, possibilities for uh, what would happen, and the path uh, will, uh, to a great extent, dictate uh, the outcome. So this is going to be a very path dependent um, uh, uh, process. Uh, now, um, going, you know, to, to um, uh, so actually, let me question. let me sure. actually like you know, interject here for a little bit. So uh, it is true, you know, kind of there are probably thousands of scenarios available, and there are a number of scenarios which are more likely than others. So Said actually mentioned one scenario based on five assumptions. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the issue of uh, security and stability, given the reactions of the security system of the Islamic Republic, was taken as stable in Said's scenario. And he himself considered that that may not be the case. Uh, he also mentioned that, that uh, the fact that uh, the integrity of the country can be kept more or less together, the, that was also was a given. And we, both, and we know that both of those assumptions may not actually, uh, may not be as smooth as we want them to be. Uh, based on what Morgan mentioned, he mentioned that, that we may need to probably uh, have a conversation uh, with some elements of the current government about uh, some concessions in return for uh, security. Um, we probably can have some, uh, we, we probably can have some discussions, uh, uh, similar discussions with uh, groups within the opposition that may, uh, may want to strike a different path moving forward. Uh, given these uh, these considerations, Borgan, what do you think that the most likely paths uh, for the uh, for the transition period are going to look like? I know that I'm asking a hard question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not in, I'm not going to even venture into uh, 
predicting what 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 might happen um at this stage i think i i can revert to what said was uh, saying and you know uh, basically talk about uh what what would be um a feasible slash um uh, acceptable path you know um we're going to have um, a series of uh, devastating challenges uh, ahead of us um, say describe uh, some of them in terms of the security and all of that but i'm going to uh, hone on to um, specific economic uh, issues that iran is facing right now and uh, and i think as i described uh, a lot of them could be resolved um, once you don't have uh, the current political structure in place uh, in particular um, i think iran uh of course everybody knows about um its uh foreign challenges uh, in terms of uh, nuclear uh, ambitions you know sort of the uh, maintenance and uh, expansion of its uh, Shia hegemony uh, in the region and beyond the region and all of that and how that has um, caused tremendous economic opportunities for Iran. Uh, but uh, the same to a great uh, extent also applies within the Iran. We have uh, a banking sector which is uh, basically by any reasonable um, measure uh, is completely bankrupt. Uh, it, it's not only, you know, uh, uh, stopped functioning as a uh, 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 method of intermediation between uh, people who want to save and, you know, uh, industries and people who want to uh, borrow and invest. Uh, in, rather, it, it has become this Ponzi scheme for a long time and, you know, it, it's uh, being used uh, by uh, the kleptocracy in order to enrich um, uh, members of uh, the state. Uh, so uh, this is something which, uh, in my mind, uh, could be addressed uh, more or less uh, uh, effectively uh, the moment you don't have uh, the uh, political structure of the Islamic Republic in place. Uh, you, you can, you know, um, of course, all of these issues could be debated amongst economists in terms of uh, the details of them, uh, but more or less, you know, we can have uh, a, a bail-in structure for the banking sector in Iran. Uh, we can uh, in, in make, make a legitimate case in order to go to the IMF, and this has happened even, in, you know, in um, uh, Eastern Europe in the collapse of the uh, uh, Soviet bloc, uh, and it could be done in a much more reasonable way in Iran because they did not have uh, many of the basics of uh, uh, an economy which could function uh, as a free economy in Iran. You know, um, uh, fortunately, we didn't go down the path of uh, sort of. Uh, uh, communism uh, in the aftermath of 1979 and you know there are some elements of uh, uh, entrepreneurship still uh, strong in Iran and we, we can have a vibrant economy because of that uh, you can go to the IMF get the you know um, necessary uh, funding in order to uh, stabilize your uh, macro economy you can uh, uh, revisit your banking sector uh, nationalized part of these banks which are all you know uh, sort of um, uh, uh, they are completely dead uh, go you know go with the um, uh, bailing for uh, the ones which uh, are used by kleptocracy uh, make uh, those large uh, deposit holders uh, uh, share the losses made on these uh, banks balance sheet uh, and and sort of uh, uh, make a clean and functional uh, banking sector uh, out of this dysfunctional and bankrupt uh, banking sector that uh, you currently have in Iran. And you cannot do any of those uh, right now because of um, the political structure that, uh, you know, say, describe, you know. Um, and, and it's not like uh, these are um, out of box uh, ideas. These are the ideas that uh, some elements of uh, uh, the bureaucracy uh, in uh, the so-called, you know, uh, uh, 
دولت اعتدال try to uh, achieve but immediately uh, uh, collapse because it cannot happen under the Islamic Republic uh, under that political structure. Uh, so in, a, so in, in, in the sense what you are saying is that, that we can stabilize the uh, we can stabilize the banking system uh, by guaranteeing deposits for small time holders uh, by putting some defunct banks into, into some sort of conservatorship, restructure them given the funds available from international institutions, and essentially leave them to be privatized after there is a constitutional mandate. Uh, once we have a constitutional assembly and the constitution has been put to vote and agreed upon by, by the citizens. Absolutely. And, you know, that, that's, the, that's the banking sector. The other sector that, you know, um, uh, in fact, Said has uh, worked on it extensively. Uh, are, are all those, you know, uh, entities, so-called, you know, uh, boneyards uh, in the Islamic Republic? Uh, the estimates are, so you that know, actually, uh, so essentially, we are going to the point that we are going to talk about the assets, uh, the extractive uh, institutions set up by the Islamic Republic over these five, five decades that they have been in power, and they need to be addressed. Absolutely, you know that that that's gonna be. Uh, sort of uh, obviously a thorny uh, issue because some of those assets uh, were uh, the result of uh, uh, what happened in the uh, uh, sort of uh, the brutal uh, early uh, episode of the Islamic Republic. Some of those assets need to be uh, returned to their original owners. Uh, uh, but even after accounting for those, um, you can imagine, you know, something uh, between 150 to 200 uh, billion dollars of uh, assets would be left out. And this is not uh, an insignificant amount for an economy in the size of uh, Iran. And, uh, and, you know, we need to, um, I have my views on uh, how this could be a return to the public. Uh, it needs to uh, privatize, but not in the same way that it would uh, sort of enrich the uh, existing or a new uh, autocracy in Iran. Uh, so the the actually, issue of uh, corporate governance would be um, uh, would be paramount uh, in, in this uh, process. So since Said actually has ex extensive experience about these type of bunyads and institutions, why, uh, why don't we go to Said to see what he has to say about that? I, I want to say something about the issue of sanctions because I hear it a lot. Uh, I think, <clears throat> and the the issue what they what people say is that the sanctions, the sanction issue cannot be resolved easily or quickly, and that's both right and wrong. I think uh, so. The sanctions have two aspects. One is that the executive branch can suspend them very easily that can be done very quickly. Then you have the Congress. Uh, sorry, sorry. You, know, you're, you mean uh, the executive, executive branch in the United States? In the United States, yes. 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 Almost all sanctions, I, I say almost because I may be wrong on small uh, percentage of it, but I think it's all. Uh, the president has the right to suspend them if it's uh, in favor of the national security of the United States. Then you have uh, the fact that they remain on the book and uh, removing them would take time. And it's not necessarily because uh, of, you know, malintention. It's because the U.S. Congress by design is very uh, in, in, inefficient. Things really take time there. So, and I think I also think the fact that they remain on the book is not necessarily bad for the future of Iran, because those sanctions have been imposed for good reasons. And if in Iran you have the, if there is a chance that you have people who are coming to government who want to follow those policies, then those people and the Iranian population will keep that in mind that if we, if we go through that path again, uh, these sanctions are coming back. So <clears throat> I don't I don't think the issue of sanctions is a very, you know, uh, big problem. I think, as I said, they can be suspended easily. And them being on the book, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, 
<clears throat> depending on how things go on. Uh, I, so the issue of the boneyards, I think uh, it's, so we talked about the immediate two to four months or two to six months. Then you have a stabilization period. Uh, that's the period that uh, the government, uh, the transitional government should work on, you know, the constituents assembly, uh, the constitution, constitution uh, and have holding the election for the new institutions. So during that period, I think uh, there are some issues because in my view, it would, it would be something between uh, up to 18 months at least probably that you have like the new constitutions and you have a new parliament and new senate and if you have a president, new president, if you don't, a new prime minister, which, uh, which, have, the, which have constitutional legitimacy and which have the democratic legitimacy. During that time, you cannot just say, I'm not going to do anything uh, on the economy front uh, beyond like, you know, doing the basic things. I think one of the issue is what you just said, what we are, what we are going to do with these assets. These are the assets that are controlled by the, by Bonyad, by uh, foundations controlled by Khamenei, assets controlled by the IRGC, the IRGC itself is a big problem as a very large, uh, you know, business empire. Uh, maybe the issue of OROF, I don't know. I think that should be uh, resolved after you have a constitution. But these bunyot, their assets, I think they should be confiscated. They should be put in a in an escrow account, in, in a fund. I, I will discuss it in the next phase. So, they should be managed rather passively, I think, during this period. So when you have the next government, the next government can come and uh, make a decision about, about that. And I will discuss what I think is a good decision related to that. But during this period also, I think uh, we need to engage in some kind of inflation control. Uh, because if, you know, uh, we have had like, uh, four decades, 40, 40 something years of high inflation. And I think that's a mandate that the transitional government can have to engage in some monetary discipline, fiscal discipline, balancing the budget to the degree that's possible and bring down the inflation. I think it's not a very difficult thing to do as long as you don't have very crazy people in charge of the transitional government and the, you know, uh, the temporary central bank that you have. And I think another thing that should be done during this, during this period is some kind of, uh, not very radical, but some kind of uh, <clears throat> limited reconstruction of bureaucracy. Because our bureaucracy is really like very big, very inefficient. There are like positions that there is no reason for them to be. Like I was reading this news that in I don't remember exactly which institution, but was related to oil. So they had this uh, position for someone who to hold uh, prayers. And this yeah, guy, yeah, and this guy picked uh, a deputy for himself to coordinate things. So you have lots of like positions in bureaucracy that you can just you know get rid of them, and you you all spend this bureaucracy. It's not like the Shah's bureaucracy, which, which had a very, uh, which was very competent, which had a very successful, you know, managed to have successful outcomes. These are people who have like really, you know, uh, destroyed the country, the, the country. So you should be able to do, to engage in some kind of uh, bureaucracy reform, even during the, even the, with the, during the transitional government. Period. I think these are like, and the other things that we discussed before, like, you know, uh, oil and petrochemical exports, I, su I suppose that those are, those are going to continue during this period. Uh, so this second period, in my view, is uh, something that uh, it's a continuation of uh, what we had in the immediate period, but with, with some uh, more, you know, reform even though they are limited. 
so actually Sara uh, joined us now and we are happy to have her here. Uh, so Dr. Sara Bazavandi is Thank going so to much. join us from, from UK, I believe, today. And I'm from Hamburg, Germany. I'm so sorry. This is so um, time difference. For some reasons in my head, I, I thought we were starting at 7 p.m. my local time. I really sincerely apologize for my delay. No problem at all. So, uh, so at this point, what we did is that we have gone over the first, uh, let's say, the first year up to the point that we are talking about the Constitutional Assembly. And uh, following up on what Said mentioned, I mean, of in, in terms of uh, uh, macroeconomic stabilization, it, you're right, you do not need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are multiple examples and tools available to uh, absent the uh, political dead weight that the Iranian economy is carrying. Uh, we can manage inflation potentially we can manage the budget and you know put it into shape such that the uh, such that the government debt markets actually get revived and potentially you know kind of even even offer to you know, offer to international financial markets such that the such that we restore the Iranian government's access to international funds uh, at, at that stage I believe that we can potentially do better in terms of uh, managing the inflation and balancing the budget to build goodwill for future uh, for, for future projects. Uh, so if we are talking about the period that we are entering into the, uh, let's say that, you know, do you have the legitimacy of a transitional government and we are drafting the constitution? Uh, I'm, I'm throwing a question why that, you know, what do you think are going to be uh, the issues that need to be emphasized? So as we mentioned, uh, there is the, um, we mentioned the assets held by uh, various arms of the Islamic Republic. Uh, we mentioned that some of them are part of the transitional justice that we need to address and they need to be returned to their rightful owners. And it doesn't, in my opinion, it is not only the assets that were confiscated in the early stages of the of the 1978-79 revolution. We have many instances of injustice that were meted out to Iranian residents and citizens in the 43 years. So there's going to be a long queue of, uh, of claims that need to be addressed. Even after that, uh, depending on how the transition takes place, uh, you're going to have a substantial amount of assets that are held by different arms of the Islamic Republic. And uh, whether it is Bonyad's OGAF, IRGC, so on and so forth, uh, that need to, they need to be brought back under the view of the legitimate government of the country, whether it is for taxing purposes or it is the issue of how they need to be redistributed back to citizens. Uh, let's actually talk about that, how we, we think that these goals can be achieved and what were, uh, how should they be prioritized and how you, we believe that the Constitutional Assembly should think about that. So was that a question to me? Uh, that's actually a question to the group. So, like, you know, but, uh, know. feel yeah. free to jump so in. That, yeah, just, just, just to, to compensate for my, for my um, delay. Um, I think the, the most important when we talk about justice, it's quite important to have mechanisms, uh, international organisations, domestic processes that are well thought and well planned. Um, that's operating full transparency, uh, because I think, especially in the environment that we are talking about, where there is so much hypocrisy, so much lack of transparency, uh, so much bad governance, um, nepotism, corruption. So everything has that that will be done um, in the aftermath of the ending of the current system has to be so mindful of of these measures and has to be well thought and well, well um, you know planned and well organized um i'm i'm not sure about you know and, and of course like you mentioned it's important to rely on 
existing experiences, ex like try and tested models uh, to avoid reinventing the wheel and to avoid repeating the mistakes that, you know, you rightly mentioned the um, nationalization and confiscation of assets in 1979 and the disaster that really w w had come out as a result of those processes and those uh, mechanisms. Uh, the, the disaster is not just for the previous owners of these assets, but for the wider society, because it, these have created a different model for um, remuneration, for uh, economic profit making, for uh, um, reward, economic and financial reward for economic activities in the society. Um, and we want to end all of that. You know, we, we, we have lived, we have witnessed at least a system in which a meritocracy, working hard, um, you know, working towards your goal has has all just been been forgotten, and instead it has been replaced by nepotism. Who do you know? Who are you connected with? Whose son you are? Whose cousin you are? So we we want to have an environment which none of these exist in it. We want to have. I mean, I know that it's too rosy and too idealistic, but at least at this stage, it's important to be mindful of all of these issues that we want to, to be addressed, we want to, to address them. Um, Do you so mind if I add something? Of course, uh, go ahead. Uh, one, of the, one of the features of the, of the Islamic Republic has been large scale disenfranchisement of large segments of the population. And one of the uh, trust building efforts that any transitional and constitutional government afterwards needs to make is to bring back a large number of people who have been systematically ignored uh, from, the, uh, from the society. How do we think we can devise a system or put uh, mechanisms in place such that that sense of belonging and that sense of abandonment that they feel right now are reversed. I'm just going to add two more sentences and that, then I, I, I keep quiet for other colleagues. Um, in my opinion, achieving justice is not something that can be done over a short period of time. Of course, Agreed. one can try towards achieving it in the short term and one can build mechanisms and infrastructure, if you will, um, to, to achieve that in the long term, and everything has to be done correctly at the outset. I agree with that, but it's not something that you know the, the justice can be achieved in, in over a short period of time. So, um, to to create um, an, a, a narrative of what are our short aim uh, goals and what are short term goals and what are our long term goals, I think it's quite important to set realistic, not realistic goals, not over promising anything, not, you know, like Khomeini's speech that we're going to bring, you know, those populist approaches that we're going to bring free electricity and we're going to bring uh, the, the oil money to your to your tables. Um, so realistic goals, um, the right narrative uh, and be focused on the long term achievements and define uh, the, a, a sort of clear division between short-term goals and long-term goals that, uh, you know, uh, planning is required towards them. Say them we're gone, follow up on that. Uh, no, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with uh, Sarah's uh, two points of uh, first, uh, the fact that this won't be easy, uh, this will take time uh, on all fronts. Uh, and at the same time, I think um, it's also important to uh, recognize that there will be some significant changes. There will be some immediate uh, benefits, which, uh, which actually uh, uh, should be highlighted, should be explained to people so that they can uh, they can connect to uh, the uh, the immediate uh, benefits and uh, the existing cost of continuation of the Islamic Republic. Uh, Sarah, before you join, you know, say talked uh, extensively about the, the, the impact of um, uh, sanctions, for example, uh, we talked a little bit about um, how um, 
how the current political structure uh, has resulted in uh, the uh, almost complete bankruptcy of the banking sector and and how you know even the uh, even the bureaucracy within the Islamic Republic wanted to address those things let's say um, uh, eight years ago and they couldn't do that because they immediately hit this uh, political structure uh, and and these are not unknown things and these these could happen uh, relatively in a, a short period of time I'm not talking about overnight but within a year you can actually uh, revert to a functioning uh, banking sector as opposed to uh, the Ponzi scheme that uh, we have in Iran. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm totally uh, with uh, uh, avoidance of overpromising, but at the same time, I think I, I don't think Sarah would disagree that there are immediate things that we can address. Uh, so one one related issue, which I think, um, uh, given the current circumstances, um, uh, we should highlight. Uh, and I'm not a labor economist, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in this crowd, I don't think anybody is labor economist. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, something very uh, clear uh, is that uh, female labor force participation in Iran is at uh, very dismal uh, levels. And uh, that speaks to uh, what we see currently in Iran. There are, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about like uh, comparing Iran to uh, European countries. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, even comparing Iran to uh, to uh, Bahrain, to uh, uh, UAE, to even Saudis. You know, the only country in the region which has a labor force participation uh, below uh, Iran's current, you know, 14 percent is Iraq at 11 uh, percent, you know. Uh, which suffers um, from uh, the same uh, type of roadblocks. And of course, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Afghanistan, which uh, was a huge uh, reversal of all the progress made uh, throughout the 20 years. So the, these are the issues that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Iranian uh, women face on a daily basis, and it manifests itself uh, in what we see in terms of their uh, labor force participation. And it will uh, take time to uh, readjust all of those things to sort of, uh, uh, we, we are talking about uh, transition justice. I, th I think a big part of transition justice in Iran would be uh, transition justice uh, with regard to, uh, uh, to Iranian women and, uh, and their role in, in the country. Uh, and uh, basically, um, and not just at you know sort of the uh, figurehead level, but but I'm talking about you know uh, deep uh, all layers of the society, and and it will uh, not be immediate, but nevertheless uh, people can connect to it. People do connect to it, uh, and and you know um, there will be significant changes in uh, in my mind in a very short period of time. But then uh, it will take uh, a while. Uh, for the complete, you know, uh, fruition of uh, all the benefits you can uh, get out of uh, something as massive as going from, let's say, the current 14% uh, uh, labor, uh, female labor force participation to, uh, let's say, you know, something in the order of 50%, uh, 60%, which is uh, expected of uh, a, a country with demographics of uh, Iran. Adding to that, you know, one other immediate uh, one immediate result would be a, a, a significant reduction in youth unemployment once growth actually returns. So uh, it, while unemployment for uh, 40 year and above is significantly different from anybody between 15 to 40, uh, that we can be that we can promise and that would be expected and reasonable that once growth resumes, uh, youth unemployment would dr drop significantly, and people can and should relate to that. Uh, ideas from the group? I just wanted to add something to, to Borgan's point about the female un unemployment. Is that that is absolutely crucial, and uh, you know, fem th there is this tendency amongst a certain. Um, th um, elite, I would label them as, that are following uh, a, a certain narrative about Iran and Iranian economy, and that is to blame everything on the sanctions. Um, and I've had heard this times and again, that female unemployment is so low in Iran, and that is as a result of the sanctions and combination of the sanctions 
happens and the Trump withdrawal from JCPOA. And I want to say this is absolutely incorrect. If you look at the data, and the data is not collected by me, Sarah Bazuban, it's collected by an organization, for example, like the World Bank. You look at the data since the 1990s until 2020, the female participation in the labor force has fluctuated between 10 and 20 percent max. And we are falling far behind countries like Saudi Arabia, as you mentioned, Turkey, Egypt even. And this has nothing to do with the sanctions. This is a structural problem. And of course, it is an important issue, especially in the light of the, um, you know, the spirit of this demand for change in Iran, which is, you know, very much um, based on women's rights and protection of women's rights and women, you know, uh, uh, life, liberty being the, the core slogan of this, uh, of these uprisings. Um, and I, I, th this, of course, you know, as you mentioned, these are these are things that are uh, require require a little bit of planning. Uh, but as Mohammed mentioned, with the growth picking up, of course, they, these are things that would automatically have an impact. These are the areas that an automatic impact will uh, be uh, seen on those. But then um, my question that I would I'm sure Mohammed would uh, uh, later uh, take the uh, conversation towards is that how the growth is going to be accelerated. What are the growth sectors? Well, uh, and I'm sorry if you already talked about it, but I think it's worth uh, spending a few minutes to, to talk about that as well. Thank you. Sorry, Said, you want to talk? I think I jumped into the conversation. No, 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 no. Uh, so I just wanted to go back to what we discussed and go to the third phase, especially specifically what you meant, what your last question is about the third phase. So the phase one, which is the survival of two to six months, the second phase, which is the stabilization uh, done by the transitional government until the new uh, institutions are created. So there, the things that uh, at least I think I discussed, Borhan discussed, these are very like straightforward. So these are really not ideological, like. Uh, getting some some sanctions suspended based on a, if you follow a good foreign policy, having the resumption of oil and petrochemical export, which is again related to sanctions, having access to the currency reserve. In the first phase, engaging some of the capital control. Uh, second phase, uh, engaging inflation control, uh, having those confiscated assets sitting in an, in an escrow account. Uh, having them passively managed to the next government, which has the legitimacy to decide what to do with them, uh, come to the scene and engaging in some uh, limited reform of the bureaucracy. So these are, I think, center left, center right, uh, different groups can uh, agree, agree on. Now I want to go to the next phase, which becomes a bit, I think, ideological. I, I, I want to discuss it from a center right uh, point of view. I think these are what a coalition of center right uh, groups should insist on. The first part is uh, the issues related to the constitutions. So these are the things that the center right coalition should insist on during the time that the transitional government is still in power. I think they have to really insist on the inclusion of strong measures to defend the private property. We have to, we need to have free market economy mentioned in our constitution, I think. We need to have talks about uh, limited government. I'm just mentioning the things related to, economy, to the economic issue, not, not other things. We need to uh, have the independence of the central bank enshrined in our constitution. And I would love to see like some uh, decentralization of the administrative state on economic issues, but in the context and confines of having a strong government. So I would love to see that some uh, decision making uh, power is given to the lower, lower level, local level on, on the economic issue. So, after that, so when we reach to the point that, so I assume like the, if the center right can have them enshrined in the constitution, when we reach to the point that uh, you have a, you have an election for the parliament, or if there is a, you know, uh, 
if, if you have a republic for the in the presidential election, I think the center right coalition should come with a package of security, prosperity, and freedom. And there are things that we have to do, in my view, again, people from center left or radical left or radical right may have different views. Uh, and I want to mention them. Uh, it's, it's not ranked based on importance, it's just the thing that they wrote down. One is the agricultural reform. So we have a water problem. We had it for many years. It has become much worse now. So we need to find a way to reduce pressure on our water resources. We need to improve technology in our agriculture. And based on conversation I had with, with the experts, we really need to help the labor force to move from agriculture sector to other sectors. For example, we can uh, people uh, telling me like the tourism sector may, may be a good one to make that transition. I, I'm not saying that we have to, it, it has to happen immediately. Obviously it can't, it will have, it will create a lot of problem, but we need to think about it. We cannot be uh, an agricultural economy. That's that's not our forte. So we need to move on that front. Uh, I think a center right coalition sh can and should uh, insist on rapid ex expansion of tourism. Again, in the kind of confines of a strong government that you have, if you can secure security, then you can, uh, I can quickly move toward that. We had it, we had, uh, again, I had conversations with experts on that, and there is a, there are details, plans, detailed plans on uh, how to do that, what's the capacity for us. And a billion of dollars, the estimate is like, 20 billion is if you're reachable, or we can get from tourism. We need to move toward that. Something I really would love to see that it has this has been a pet project of mine for a long time. It's the this democratization of ownership of national oil and gas companies. Uh, I th I think the the oil has been a problem. Will be a problem if it's in the hands of the government. You will have all these uh, populist government uh, coming and trying to take that, uh, give the false promises, and really create a huge problem, political and economic. So my suggestion that I hope that, uh, again, the center-right coalition will pick up is to turning this company into a publicly traded firm, transfer a certain level of ownership to public in a certain period of time, and we can go into details of it, to, uh, how, how this share should be tradable, whether you can be able to uh, trade all of them or not. Maybe you can trade only a percentage of it to build generational wells. Maybe there should be a period that you cannot trade it until you know. Uh, things that, uh, the details of it we can discuss, but I think the principle of transferring the ownership of these companies to the public and have them publicly traded, I think that that's uh, that's important. And part of it can, a percentage of it can be still in the hands of the government. And we can you know, impose limits on what the government can do with its share of revenue. Like for example, we can say you can only use it for defense or certain part of it should go to defense, certain part should go to sovereign wealth fund. Uh, the other uh, issue, uh, Obama, whenever you want to jump, uh, to jump in. Because I do want I to jump a, in for one thing. Uh, you know, I have a long sorry. list here, so. So you know, and it is, it's a, it's an issue which is very important for me. So I'm going to mention that. 20, 25 years ago, if you talked to me when I was still young and a graduate student, I would have, uh, uh, I would have pushed for a much, much smaller welfare. Uh, welfare system in Iran. In between, two things happened. Like, you know, Sarah correctly pointed out that, uh, you know, we, we tend to blame everything on sanctions, but sanctions are not as important economically as you think as the political system is. Essentially, I view sanctions as a policy choice for the Islamic Republic. 
they have constantly maintained policies that actually result in sanctions. And it has one important effect on the population. Iranian population is not young anymore by any measure. You know, kind of the labor force has transitioned into middle age and, you know, they will soon, we are soon going to face mass retirement by people who have never seen anything by stagnation throughout their working lives. So taking care of this population when they start retiring is going to be essentially, you cannot go on and say that we are Chile circa 1980 and we are going to completely privatize everything. And tough luck, uh, you kind of, you had a bad draw and your entire working life was during uh, Islamic Republic and sanctions. Now go fend for yourself. That can't happen. So in that sense, making sure that there is dignity and needs of an aging population are taken care of during the post-Islamic Republic period should be a central pillar of the economic policies of either center-right or center-left governments. I leave it at that. You know, I get very, very excited about this issue. And, you know, for people who know me, you know, that would be a very big reversal of the positions that I had 20 years ago. But data speaks, and I'm an economist. I look at the data. I think that the policies that we need moving forward are very different given these new demographic realities of Iran compared to what I thought that would be optimal a long time ago. Sorry for taking your time. You know, that, that's exactly right. And that's why I defend, uh, you know, democratization of their ownership instead of having them to, in, totally in the hand of government or having them, you know, privatize. Uh, in, in other ways. I think that will create a minimum level of income uh, through dividends. That will create a minimum level of wealth. And uh, the second, uh, the other thing I think uh, I, I defend is, I don't have a name for it, but this is basically those confiscated assets that we discussed. After we compensate those whose assets have been stolen by the regime over years. And as, as you said, it's not just uh, in 1979. You can go to the, uh, to the record and you can see where the, the ICO, they transferred ownership of uh, some companies or assets to, to themselves. So uh, after compensating them, I think we have we can have a fund again like the ownership of national oil and gas companies that said that they said you can have shares these shares will be given to uh, every citizens and then again we can discuss uh, the process the mechanism so we have to quickly we have to go to Sarah's hand because we are running out of time uh, you know unfortunately Thank you. I, I just want to say that, you know, obviously Said has done a lot more detailed and thorough work on this in terms of, you know, um, designing um, implementable, if that's even a word, uh, plans for, for to addressing these issues. But um, a few things that comes to my mind based on Mohammed's comments is, of course, you know, you have a pension system, you're inheriting a pension system is completely shattered and you have a high number of pensioners with high life expense expectancy in Iran that have retired at the age of 50. So Iran has had a very early retirement age. So you're already inheriting a bad pension system, a large number of pensioners that their entire livelihood depends on their pensions. And you have more incoming in the years to come because as a result of the, you know, the, the older demographic. So th this is something that I'm quite mindful. So the, yes, I agree with privatization. I full heartedly support the con you know, principles of market, privatization, and so on and so forth. But you still have a very large segment of the society that are extremely vulnerable and they'd require support. So, you know, going, uh, ju just wanted to Ditto, ditto uh, Mohammed's comment, and also about the services sector. I'm I remain for this sort of medium to short to medium period of time expansion of service sector, uh, hospitality and tourism. Sorry, not services sector. I remain a little bit pessimistic. If you rely on domestic tourism uh, growth, yes, I agree. Uh, because of shrinking livelihood of Iranians, have they have many Iranians switched um, international uh, holidays to domestic holidays and. You know, there is 80, 
five plus million of us there. Hopefully some of us will be able to go back again. So there will be even more. But you, you're talking in, about an environment in which you have Turkey, for example, in the neighboring uh, environment, uh, in the neighboring region. You have UAE in the neighboring region. You have Qatar with the World Cup and all the developments. Um, so it's what would be, it's very it's very important to to focus on what would be the value added. Why would tourists choose Iran over you know a resort in Iran that is highly underinvested, highly underdeveloped in comparison? At that moment, of course, there can be plans for further development. But at that moment, what would be the value added? How would it be marketable? How would it be desirable for for international tourists? If that's the the idea behind it. Um, I had one more point that I forgot, but it will come back to me. I raised my hand again. Thank you. So we have to also be mindful that we have about, uh, I think, max five minutes left. Uh, we are going to finish at 12. So if I use one minute out of that five minutes and, and add to um, uh, the point of uh, a little bit contentious here uh, regarding um, uh, what what you would do with um, with all the various uh, economic assets in the hands of state uh, per se government? Uh, I think I think the key is gonna be providing basic minimum for everybody, which I think uh, for an oil rich country like Iran would be possible. But then on top of that, and and by bare minimum, I mean really bare minimum. But on top of that, our pension system has to get out of this uh, sort of uh, defined uh, benefit uh, structure. It's inevitable uh, for two reasons. One is that um, politically pensioners could know the consequences of uh, their um, political decisions on the performance of um, their uh, uh, savings. And by disentangling these two things, I, I guess uh, you are uh, uh, weakening uh, the structure of democracy in Iran. It's only if uh, pensioners who tend to be in every country, uh, including in Iran, would be a, a large part of the uh, democratic decision making. Only those uh, could be uh, basically uh, uh, we'd be looking and following all that's happening in the uh, economic performance. Like to say? No, I agree. To, I, I totally agree. And uh, the things that they were describing, it, obviously, this, and I agree with Sora too, uh, these are not something that will happen like, you know, in the year one. These are like, uh, these are platform for, in my view, since center right, coalition and how you have to manage uh, the, the, the country and uh, I there, there are like other measures there for cost cutting like we have to cut a lot of uh, cost in our bureaucracy I think mm -hmm. it's possible and there are measures for how to uh, help the growth uh, with, with that I think over a good period of time uh, we we will be able to resolve some of these issues and if you have the constitutional legitimacy democratic legitimacy you can make a hard decision the pension fund problem it's one of those like you have you need to explain to the population and make hard decisions there uh, because if you don't you will be you really cannot uh, solve the problem you have to uh, you know print money uh, and then mm -hmm. think things uh, will be even of course, I just want to mention one thing about the industrial policy. I think you have to, you need to have a strong public-private partnership in defense and high-tech area and divest and deregulate the other area that the government right now is very much involved. So I just want to add one point, if I may. Uh, there is a difference between a big government and an efficient government. And uh, a, a, an efficient government does not necessarily mean to, uh, need to do many things. It just needs to do few things very, very well. And uh, we need to actually go back to that principle to provide 
good and efficient governance for, uh, given the bureaucracy and you know kind of steer the bureaucracy in that direction rather than the big government and the extensive government that the uh, Islamic Republic had actually put in place that pays a lot of attention to how you dress but doesn't pay attention on how to protect the environment. Uh, but it, uh, we do not need to have a minimal government, but we need to have a very efficient government. And that's an important issue to actually be included in the governing coalitions uh, platforms to actually steer the country to that direction. I wanted to add that uh, just as a point to be there on the table. We have we actually have run out of time. That was a very good discussion. It's unfortunate that we couldn't completely utilize Sarah's time here, uh, but there, there's going to be other opportunities, I hope. Uh, with that, I'm going to actually close the discussion today. Thank you very much for all your time, and I hope all our audience enjoyed these views that we, uh, that we uh, dis displayed and explained today for hopefully a much, much better and much more uh, efficient and successful Iran in the future. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.